Hello, hello, good evening. Um, my name is Rohan Naidu. Uh, thanks to, thank, thank you so much for the kind introduction. Um, I was clearly in no way inspired by current events while writing this doc. Um, it's a doc called Milky Way, an Immigrant Story. Some people might not like to hear it, but not only is this country a country of immigrants, <laughs> but it turns out the entire galaxy galaxy of immigrants and so that's what this talk is going to be about today to try and like give you a sense for what that story is so here I have uh, a picture of the Milky Way our beautiful galaxy um, looks like a very serene place but you already know from the last talk that there's a lot of chaos beneath the surface in principle in particular this is what our computer simulations for what the history of our galaxy looks like predicts so you see, um, each color corresponds to an individual immigrant galaxy that is falling in and coming together, right? So this is how our galaxy was made according to our best models and best computer uh, programs. So every single color here represents a distinct family of stars that came in together. And these stars then were distributed all across the length and the breadth of our galaxy. Um, and they are now resettled everywhere. Just by looking at these systems, just looking at these stars, if I had not colored them for you, there's no way you'd be able to tell that they were like, you know, uh, from a particular different origin or a different place. Today, they all come together and they all are the Milky Way. So this is what we think our galaxy's buildup was like. So what does it look like in terms of like, you know, um, specifics? So as we saw in the previous talk, we have this pitter patter of satellites that are coming into the Milky Way. Right, the gang leader, the ring leader of that set of satellites is this really massive system, uh, the Magellanic Clouds. So any like picture of the Milky Way will really like highlight these two blobs at the bottom, right? Um, and you see them. You can even just go to the southern hemisphere. Um, trust your eyes, right? So these are these two giant fuzzy blobs that you see on the sky. Um, and even if you don't have a very fancy camera, uh, our colleagues in the southern hemisphere can just pull out their iPhone and give you real evidence for a very major galactic act of immigration in play, right? So these two enormous galaxies are entering the Milky Way for the first time. So this is, this is a very recent chapter in our history. So we see these galaxies as they are coming in, right? If we go slightly farther back in our history, if we rewind the clock to about five billion years ago, the galaxies that came in then today present in the form of these garlands of stars that bedeck our galaxy. So this is an example of a system called the Sagittarius Dwarf Galaxy. Um, it came into our galaxy five billion years ago, and the stars from it are now streaming in these stellar streams, right? So you see the difference between these like blobs that are still intact, and these kind of like, you know, streams that are beginning to form around the core of this galaxy as it's being uh, resettled. And indeed, we see like hundreds of these streams across the sky. So the Sagittarius stream is the one towards the bottom of your screen here, the one that I was just showing you, but it's not alone. So these relatively recent arrivals, we see in the form of these gossamer ribbon-like structures that stretch across the sky. But going even further back, um, the, the, the stars that came in, the, the families of galaxies that came in, are much more mixed and scattered. They're, they're everywhere. They do not present in these types of very like cogent structures. These stars are really resettled um, across the length and breadth of our home galaxy. So in the last few years, the, the key development has been, we've been able to unscramble this very like complex um, history. And so those are the results that I want to share with you today. How we rebuilt this timeline and filled in all the gaps. And the field that I work in that does this is called galactic archaeology. So what we try to do is we try like archaeologists today on the earth, we go digging, except instead of digging for artifacts and lost and fallen cities and Atlantises, we are trying to uh, dig out these historical galaxies, these previous events of migration. So just to show you an example of like how this might look, here I'm showing you a movie of a single galaxy that is falling into our Milky Way. It's colored in purple here. So while its stars are being scattered everywhere in this plot, this here I'm just showing you their location on the sky, you'll notice that on the right-hand side, where instead of just plotting their simple motions, 
I'm plotting quantities like the total energy in those stars or the total angular momentum in those stars. Despite them being like so scattered, they still show up as a family. They still show up as a cogent group of stars. This is really good news for galactic archaeologists because if you want to unscramble this whole mess, the plot on your right tells you that your field still has hope, right? Like it's not, uh, it's not, it's not, Atlantis is not awashed. We still, we still have a compass to it. So to give you a sense of what's going on here, right? It's, this is the classic uh, conservation of energy or angular momentum. My favorite ice skater, Yuzuru Hanyu, is making all these beautiful ribbon-like features and forms through the air. But his energy and angular momentum at the moment of when he is jumping up is still relatively conserved, right? And so that is the same principle that is in play when these families of stars are coming into our galaxy. They might be scattered everywhere, but when you look at their energies and angular momenta, they still show up as these cogent groups. The other, the other thing that helps us do galactic archaeology is that um, you remember the chemical DNA. So every star um, remembers the environment that it was born in, where it was nourished, where it like, came to life. Um, so roughly the way this works is that a particular family of stars might be very rich in iron. A particular family of stars might have a lot of oxygen. And so you can imagine building up this kind of very complex chemical signature across essentially all the elements of the periodic table. And so it's kind of like, you know, like you remember the famous quote, right? All of us are made of star stuff. Well, if you were born in some other galaxy, the star stuff you would have been made of uh, would have been very different from this star stuff. And so that's kind of the fundamental premise of what's happening here. And to give you a mental model for what might be going on, the idea here is that, you know, you might have, so this is one of my favorite maps. It's a map of New York City, okay? It's a map of New York City, but it's uh, splintered by the various communities that make New York City up. So here you have somewhere over here, you have Little Italy, you have Little India, you have Chinatown, you have like an area that you know you can get really good Southeast Asian food at. And this is great, right? Because you have all these like immigrants who come from all over the world to make New York City their home. And yet they still retain their identity, right? They, they retain their flamboyant, bright sense of fashion. They retain their memory of like, you know, cuisine, which we are very thankful for, or else what else would there to be eat uh, in, this, in, this, uh, in this country? And so that's exactly what's happening with these galaxies. These stars are coming in from various sources, but through this chemical DNA, they still retain a shared sense of identity that we are able to unlock uh, with our various astronomical observations. So coming back to our project of trying to reconstruct this history, of, of, of unjumbling this past, this was all uniquely enabled thanks to this amazing satellite that flew a few years ago. So it's ESA's Gaia satellite. And so what Gaia does is it makes very precise measurements of how stars in our galaxy are moving. So what is their velocity, what is their position, how far they are. Your mental model for what the satellite is is it's basically one of these like annoying traffic cameras, except it's not annoying, it's not giving us speeding tickets, but it's basically sitting on this intergalactic highway and watching all the stars go past and sending us measurements for what's happening um, as these stars go around our galaxy. So thanks to Gaia, we are able to like, you know, go from a static picture of the Milky Way to this kind of like, picture where we really like know the overall flows and motions of the stars across our galaxy. So for example, in this projection here at the center, um, these, these whitish arrows are showing you the flow of stars in the galactic disk, in the Milky Way's disk, where we are all like rotating cogently. So you can imagine like measuring this for like a billion stars, uh, which then allows us to really like get back to this kind of map. So what does this map look like for our galaxy? And so this is what this map looks like. When we go back to our favorite ice skater projection, uh, we are able to isolate these various blobs of stars that are falling in. And uh, as I'll get to in a moment, um, these are the only galaxies that you really can name whatever you want and get away with it. And so, of course, we've made, uh, we've made you know, immense use of this privilege to call them uh, things after our favorite characters. But this is what the map of the galaxy looks like when you reconstruct it, when you like, you know, like tag all these stars to their various originating um, immigrant galaxies, right? So the stars born in the Milky Way 
Um, here I'm showing you basically a fraction of how much each component makes up of our galaxy as a function of distance away from the disk, from the central regions. And so you see, like the Sagittarius dwarf galaxy I was showing you earlier, these garlands of stars that uh, encircle our galaxy is shown in like dark blue on the right. Stars born in the Milky Way are shown in light blue. There's this enormous number of stars that came in with a galaxy that we unfortunately named Gaia Sausage Enceladus. Um, <laughs> clearly, clearly optimized for public outreach, right? Like that's how we like get the word out. But coming back to like the naming of things, right? So it turns out nowadays, if you discover something like this, if you're lucky enough to discover a new satellite of the Milky Way, you have to name it after the constellation it is sitting in. So unfortunately, you end up with names such as, you know, Andromeda 34 or Leo 16, and then you go back to your poor relatives and friends and tell them, you know, I discovered a galaxy, but I had to call it Leo 19. <laughs> If you discover a stream nowadays, like one of these like gossamery structures, um, the convention is to name it after water features, after rivers, which is kind of beautiful and poetic, right? These are rivers across the sky. So you have names such as Indus and Sutlej and Jhelum and you know all these great rivers that you can imagine. But the reason why you should work in this galactic archaeology field is because these stars are scattered across the entire sky, so they aren't really in any constellation. So what are we going to call them? They aren't exactly streams either, so calling them after the water bodies doesn't make sense either. So at the moment, it is truly open season, as our colleagues who named it Gaia Sausage Enceladus know very well. Um, it truly is open season. But I, of course, used my privilege as a discoverer of a new dwarf galaxy uh, very carefully and instead named it after the Monkey King from, uh, from uh, the Journey to the West. So, I mean, just happened to be like, you know, one of the texts that I love the most at uh, Yale and US College Singapore, which is not an outpost of Yale. It is an independent uh, university with its own curriculum and own faculty and uh, so on and so forth. But coming back to Wukong, um, so this is a galaxy that I found here. It, it, it occupies a tiny little sliver in this whole budget. It's like this tiny little purple strip on the top. So not a huge contributor to the Milky Way, but you know, still very important. And then you get to write uh, really long explanations in the footnotes of your paper for why this galaxy should be called Wukong. Um, in this case, uh, Rohan from 2020 was very inspired because Sun Wukong is imprisoned under a mountain by the Buddha for his uprising against heaven and is later set free by the scholar Tripitaka. Here, we play the role of the scholar, setting Wukong free and, you know, like discovering it and so on. Um, so clearly, you know, a PhD is a very long degree and you have to find ways of entertaining yourself. <laughs> but just to give you a sense of the level of detail we've been able to manage to reconstruct in the last few years, here I'm showing you how this Gaia Sausage Enceladus galaxy entered our Milky Way and how its stars are dispersed today. So you see it came in, and then it really like, you know, the stars from it were resettled all across our galaxy. And today they live uh, pretty much everywhere. Um, there was a question on the quiz which asked you to like name the closest dwarf galaxy to us. And there might be an answer like, you know, about some like cogent structure. But if you were to look in terms of like stars that came from elsewhere, they probably like belong to this galaxy. The nearest stars to us that were born outside the galaxy came from the Gaia Sausage Enceladus. So that is, the, that is the note I want to end on today. I hope I gave you a sense for the very rich and variegated history our Milky Way has had. It might look like a cogent, um, fully functional, very healthy galaxy today, uh, and it is but it owes it to this grand history of galaxies that have come from far away and have resettled and made the Milky Way their own home and made it a better galaxy than it was. Uh, but yeah, that's the talk and I'll take questions. Thank you so much.